and show us what we are doing. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab. Um, so, you know, I will now start. And first and foremost, let me just give a quick uh, welcome to all the four speakers, all of whom I know directly or indirectly. So welcome, Ishfaq Saab. You have become a permanent fixture. I'm so happy because you bring a wealth of knowledge. And I think it's also a good revision for your classes at the university where you're teaching now. And Dick, thank you um, for joining so late. I know you've had your cup of cocoa, but you know I will try and make enough noise so that you don't fall asleep. And um, then thank you again, John, for coordinating the time. I know it was a tad difficult, but so good to see you from across the pond, as they say. And Javed Saab, thank you once again for joining. Uh, it's been a while since we met. Um, I just want to set the stage. I mean, Nadim, Dr. Nadim has already said that um, you know it's a very important subject. We all know. Um, it has been an important subject for the last 30 plus years that I've been trying to do something on railways here in Pakistan, but it seems that very few people actually do something about it. So I have <laughs> the purpose, <laughs> the purpose PIDE is uh, organizing this is that, as you all know, all of these uh, consultations are going to take the form of a, of a book. Uh, which is uh, normally every quarter or uh, every month, there's a different subject on which PIDE assembles kind of a knowledge brief, which has articles from everybody, and it goes to the government, it goes to the wider audience in Pakistan. It gets picked up by and large by almost every think tank and the government. So we are hoping that we do one on railways by September, which will include all these deliberations. So we've talked about uh, so far in the previous two webinars, we discussed a little bit about the vision for railways in Pakistan. Um, we, we basically also understood that really a vision for a 21st century railway and what it should look like um, does not exist because simply uh, everybody lives in the past and wants the railway of the Gora Saab or, the, or what the Britishers left. Um, the second thing, uh, I think in the second seminar, we deliberated a lot upon the history. And I think the two important lessons that we got from a very, very good uh, webinar in which I think the professor, <laughs> um, Dr. Imran, who has written about the history of Pakistan railways actually uh, made us realize that somehow railway has been, when we talked of transportation in Pakistan, movement of goods and people, uh, somehow post the Harvard advisory group, uh, that the focus has been more on cars, uh, buses, trucks, roads, and what have you. It, it Somehow railway has been kind of the, the ignored, the stepchild. And a part of it, he, he explained, is if you look at the historic picture in Pakistan, not just the fiscal allocations, but also the planning, the policy, that railway was never part of the transport policy. I mean, it, it was a gift that you got and you basically looked it in the mouth. That's how it happened. But in any ways, today, I think the order of uh, speaking is as follows. Uh, Dick, because it's latest where he is, gets the first go. And Dick is going to talk a little bit about track access around the world. Then we'll have John Winner. He's going to talk about Pakistan's approaches and then followed by Ashfaq Saab and then by Javed. My request to you speakers is that, you know, you know why we're doing this. Uh, let's stay focused about 10, because it's four speakers, let's do 10 minutes per speaker. And um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Dick open and then we will have question and answers after that. And also I think Dr. Nadeem and I will try and keep it interesting. Thank you. Dick, please unmute yourself. We are unable to hear you so far. Okay. Um, let me get rid of that one. Right. Um, do you want me to try and share a screen, Amar, or are your people going to put up my presentation or what? Mansoor and Nabil, can you put on uh, the presentation? Sir, the presentation is not hanging, sir. Okay, they do not have your presentation. I, I think, why don't you try and share a screen? Well, I'll uh, try. Um, let me just try and see what happens here. Share. Ah, good. So that Excellent. seems to have worked. Let me just try and do slideshow even more. Good. 
Can you all see that? Can everyone see this? Should they track access around the world? You absolutely can. You absolutely can. Please go ahead. See it. All right. So, look, I've got a presentation here that's got um, something like uh, 15 slides. Because it's a bit difficult to talk about um, track access in much less. But uh, in order to keep within 10 minutes, I'll <coughs> skip very lightly over some of these slides and just <coughs> to the main points. So I think the first thing that's um, most important is, uh, you know, track access. What is it? Well, it's really just an arrangement by which a railway operator can run trains over somebody else's tracks. And uh, it's existed a long, long time. It's been in railways for 200 years. The first uh, wagonways and canals all operated on this basis. The first public ra railways were expected to do so. And the venerable Liverpool and Manchester Railway had an arrangement as far back as 1837. So it's very common in countries where there's railways wanting to run over each other's tracks. So people like Union Pacific and Burlington Northern will have arrangements by which they run over each other's tracks, sometimes by arrangement, but sometimes because government said you've got to allow somebody else's trains to run over your lines. And in Brazil, over 10% of NTK run under these arrangements. So they were all, they're all voluntary generally voluntary. They've got simple arrangements generally and they're commercial negotiations. Now associated with it is track access charges, which as I'll say later has become a, it's almost a university level subject this, if not a PhD, but it's actually a very simple thing. It's how much does the guy running the train pay to the guy who has the, the tracks? So sometimes they're very simple. And the very first one, the Grand Junction Railway, which ran from Birmingham to Liverpool, it wanted to, its freight was six shillings to go over a bit of the Liverpool and Manchester and get access to Liverpool. And the Liverpool and Manchester just said, well, pay us two bob out of the six shillings. So they did. And that was track access charges, 1837 style. Very simple. Uh, Generally, they're on a cost share sharing basis and you split the cost uh, traditionally. Uh, and this is what I used to work out when I started working in railways, It'd work out in real life. Infrastructure was divided on the basis of gross tons and uh, communications and signaling and train control on the basis of train kilometers. But the Americans, it's a bit complicated for the Americans. They tend to do it just on wagons, which is easier to count. But the basic uh, principle here is that one way or another, these arrangements are uh, designed to recover the total cost of the track from either the operator or the person who owns the uh, lines. But that was too simple, of course, uh, once economists got into railways. So, What's been developed now is what I call as of right access, which is a very different animal where anybody really who satisfies technical and financial requirements can turn up and say, I want to run a train. And uh, in Europe, uh, if somebody does that, uh, he's meant to be allowed on the system. Of course, uh, some of the European railways uh, develop defensive tactics to stop this happen happening. But um, in theory, if you or I went to, well, Belgium's not a good example because they won't let you in. But if you or I went to Italy, we could, as long as we could show we ran a railway, we could run one tomorrow. It's also happened in Australia because it was a more general policy to require all infrastructure to provide access to third parties. So that includes electricity pipelines, gas, gas pipelines, and so on. And railways got caught up in that. And in Russia and the CIS, Russia is a bit of a special case because they decided to move all the wagons to the private sector. 
when they all got to, when they all needed to be replaced. So nowadays, what you've got is track authorities and track operators, train operators, sometimes totally separate, sometimes separate companies under a holding company, depending on the political strength of the railway, its unions, and so on. Um, but the main difference, as I said at the start, third parties have the right, the absolute right to obtain access as long as they're financially capable and they're technically capable. So you've got these two sorts of um, access. Now, generally, there's a, these days, there's a track access agreement uh, where it's as of right access, then these agreements need to cover the services that the track authority gives, um, which vary. The responsibilities of the train operator, responsibilities of the track operator authority, which is generally to provide a decent railway and make sure that things uh, that they don't interrupt the trains too often. The procedures when there are accidents and incidents, what do you do? Do you pay money? Do you have a knock for knock arrangement whereby and in Australia it's under half a million? I think if you have an accident and it's under half a million. There's no great inquest as to whether it was the infrastructure or the rail or the train that was at fault. They just they just say, well, that's the sort of thing that happens. And the fees and charges. So these are normally summarized in a document which is called a network statement in Europe and access undertaken in Australia. So this isn't the contract, but it's the information package. It tells you everything you need to know about how you get access. It's a key document, and uh, if you want to know how access is done in Italy, say, you go to the net and you find their network statement, and that will tell you all about it. So this uh, slide just says what's in the network statement. If you're interested, you go to this thing at the bottom, rne.eu, and uh, RNE is the Association of Track Authorities in Europe, and you can get the you can get the network statements, and in many cases you can get draft contracts as well uh, for whichever country you want to look at. In Australia, you can do it by going to um, ARTC, which is the Australian Rail Track Corporation. So then we come to track charges. Well, now. This is a thing in which nowadays it's a big growth industry. If you're a young economist and you want to make lots of money out of railways, this is the thing to be in because there's a lot of money hinging on these and uh, they all depend on generally on going to regulators of one sort or another. But there's three big questions. How much of the infrastructure costs are you going to recover? then how much from passenger, how much from freight? And how should you levy these charges? Well, there's no fixed rules on this. Uh, people write volumes on this stuff. But you can see here in Europe, where there was meant to be standard policies, that the amount of infrastructure costs recovered through the track access charges ranged from 0%, near enough in Norway and Sweden, to 100% in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. So this is a this reflects the traffic they carry and the government policy towards supporting the railway. So in Eastern Europe, a lot of freight, you can charge quite well for freight and um, they try to recover all their costs. Because if not, it's got to come from the government and the government would sooner spend its money on health, on education and so on. In Western Europe, where they're much richer, they are quite happy to spend to support a lot of the infrastructure costs. And you can see that uh, typically 50 percent or more. Is provided by the government and the rest is collected from the users. Uh, this has got to be a bit of a habit now in Europe, and at the moment, uh, many 
railways are lobbying to have zero access charges to help them recover from COVID. So full cost or marginal cost? Well, there's only one rule that I think applies, which is that you've got to charge at least marginal cost. So if you run a train and it wears out the track a bit, then you need to recover that cost. And um, so you can see in this map of Europe that there's a whole load of different policies there. Marginal cost, pure marginal cost is the light green. Uh, full cost is the light blue. And the rest are all in between. But uh, of course, the problem is what's marginal cost? And no one really knows for railways. Um, people write papers about it and so on. Uh, my The traditional view was that the marginal cost of infrastructure was about 40% of the average cost. And uh, it, it depends on the density. If you're a lightly used railway, it'll be less. If you're a railway like China or Russia, it'll be much more. But you can see here from this bar chart of passenger costs and passenger trains and freight trains, they're all over the place. Some countries, the passengers are charged more than the freight. Others, it's the other way around. So you can sort of look at these at your leisure. Um, again, they reflect government policy. France is desperate to prop up its freight trains because it runs. it's hopeless at running freight trains, in my view. So it's got very low access charges so it can compete against road. It's got a high charge there for passenger trains, but that's, um, uh, that's biased by the TGV. And you can see when you get to Latvia, which is that LV, that's the tallest one, that's all freight going from Russia to the ports. So of course, they're, um, they're onto that. They <laughs> charge like a wounded bull for that stuff. Now, the next thing is, how do you go about charging it? Well, you could have a simple structure. You could have a, 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 a more complicated one. Then you can have a multiplicative one. And then you can have one where you're adding on bits and pieces. So they're all different ways. And I wouldn't say that any one way is right or wrong, except that the German one used to be the size of a um, small encyclopedia. And you can get them down to a single sheet of paper if you try. And I've got three now to just, again, I won't go through these, but you can study them. Charging systems have got more and more complex. There's no, there's no uniformity, even in Europe, where they've got the EU handing down regulation after regulation. They're all over the place. It's like a, it's like a plum pudding. And it's charged in different ways. And then there's lots and lots of additional fees. So these are like the budget airlines. You know, once you, <laughs> right, you, you get the ticket, but then there's an admin fee, there's, an, there's a security fee, there's an environmental surcharge, there's a lo low noise fee discount, and so on. And then they've got various arrangements for the fuel. And then they've also got charges for facilities that frankly most people don't need and this is track authorities trying to turn themselves this is the the business model for track authorities we won't just concentrate on having a decent track and running the trains on time we'll have all these other things here but it doesn't have to be that complicated so this is ARTC in Australia one sheet of paper it's a very simple thing so much a train kilometer so much a, so much a gross ton kilometer and uh, i'm proud of this one because i designed it 30 years ago and it has hardly changed and uh, all that we do now is when the trains are a bit heavier a bit higher axle load which tends to knock the track about a bit more we charge a bit more so that's track access charges uh, tr track access in a nutshell and um, I think the lesson from that is access is just about 
finding a system by which by which an operator can run trains over the track of another person. It does not have to be open access. It can be arranged and contracted. It does not need all the paraphernalia that uh, is included in Europe. And, uh, you know, many of the arrangements that are made commercially are quite simple. So there's a whole spectrum of arrangements there that are used around the world. Um, but my preference for Pakistan would to take the, um, when in doubt, take the simple approach. So that's it, Emma. Thank oh, you back to you. Take, yeah, thank you very much. You know, I, I, am a, I am a Longhorn, so I went to UT Austin, and then we have the school next to us, which we think are just games of farmers. You're the Aggies, right? So when you said this is simple and that's the Aussie way, a lot of Aggie Longhorn jokes came to mind, but I, because of the audience, I shall not divulge them. I think John gets a few of them. But nevertheless, uh, before I hand over to John, let me just comment on a few things. And uh, I think for the audience, and because there's a lot of people in Pakistan here, especially students joining, uh, first and foremost, I think one of the things I would have added to that, uh, Dick, would be when you think globally in terms of access charges, I think it's the objective of the track owner that should be front, at uh, foremost and at front. Because I see in the great European models, which are highly complicated, and yes, you're right, one should uh, take that up as a business. I'm sure a lot of people have. Um, essentially, you have a mix up between ops and maintenance, replacement, congestion, you know, it, it is kind of all over the place, right? And really, uh, at the end of the day, as you, and then between uh, the margin cost and charging full, again, the objectives of the government are at, at the front, right? If the government wants you to encourage rail traffic, well, you know, then you go for marginal or marginal plus, but not full recovery. Um, for those uninitiated, I liked uh, Dick's first slide, and I want everyone to keep that in mind, especially the students, that, you know, this is no different than tolls that you pay on the highway. Now, whether it's a congestion charge, it's a shadow toll or a real toll in real time that you pay, let's say between Lahore and Islamabad, this is already being done. So there is no rocket science about that. Now we know the negotiation that the National Highway Authority, uh, which owns the motorways in Pakistan has on, for example, with the M2 is very, very simple. It's based on affordability. Right, it's, it does not correlate to axle load damage or congestion or any of those stuff. So similarly, I think that this is first and foremost, I think the railways in Pakistan is trying to follow the lead of the foreign office of Pakistan by overcomplicating it, just like most bureaucrats do everything in Pakistan. Second, I think that there is also something that we need to start looking at is that in order to encourage rail, maybe the two bob approach is really the, the best one to do here right now. But before we go forward um, and have our discussion, over to you, John. What do you think of Pakistan? And let me just quickly, by the way, because John's come on for the first time, a quick intro for John. He's the founder and principal of the Harold Winter, Harold Winner Thompson Sharp Klein Inc. And he served as the president CEO. He has more than 30 years experience in the transportation industry. I per se ran across John when I was writing a paper in 2008 in Afghanistan on you know what the Afghans should do. I mean, he remembers or not, but we, we got in touch. But welcome here, and thank you again for, for joining us, John. Over to you. Okay, fine, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if this works. Can you see it? Yes, yes we can, John. Okay, okay. Good. Thank you. good. Now, I am, uh, uh, I am, uh, happy to be here. Uh, I've been working with Dick Bullock and uh, a number of folks for uh, quite a few years in the rail sector. I'll give a quick set of qualifications. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. rail industry um, working for larger railways, so I'm very familiar with how U.S. railroads do access agreements, and there's lots of different kinds. Um, I've had done a, a fair amount of work in Pakistan over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, including uh, doing some concession support uh, on the original uh, concessions, which I'm going to talk about 
a little bit today. Um, did a market analysis. I've done work for the ADB. We did railway strategy work. We reviewed uh, with with Dick the PC1 for the CPEC plan. We came up with a plan for uh, Karachi ports for how can you get more traffic on the railway? How do you get it off off the highway on, on onto the railway? And we just looked at a feasibility study for a, a new a bunch of new facilities between Karachi and Pipri, including a double track line and a new um, uh, a new facility at Pipri to take over a lot of the work that's now done in downtown Karachi. Anyway, uh, Pakistan is a uh, big country, uh, 225 million. It's the fifth largest country in the world. Uh, it's had fairly good GDP growth, averaging about 4%. Imports and exports have been growing faster than the economy. And uh, uh, for Pakistan, uh, nearly all the imports and exports flow through the major ports in Karachi on the Arabian Sea, that's down here in the bottom, for those who are not from Pakistan. Uh, but most Pakistanis live in the northern part, about a thousand kilometers from the Arabian Sea coast. And this should be an ideal market for railroads. This should be, pre this should be perfect. You have a lot of uh, tons coming in here, in and out here, and they're all going up here. So it's a thousand kilometers away. However, over the last couple of decades, Pakistan has invested in highways. Um, in Pakistan, freight transport is provided by both rail and um, road networks. But the logistics capabilities uh, that have evolved over the last 20 years have been shaped by the freight transport services available in Pakistan. And those have shifted heavily to um, uh, road transport. Uh, Pakistan has built a lot of roads and highways. It has uh, an unregulated trucking industry. Um, it's a lot of small private private truckers. Competition in the trucking industry is intense and uh, road transport costs are very low. Um, it's not unusual in many markets. It's like that in uh, North America, some parts of, uh, of, uh, of um, some parts of South America. R railways, if they want to get traffic, they have to actually want it. They have to work for it. They have to provide a service. Well, Pakistan railways didn't do that. Freight service collapsed after 2010. Um, the railway uh, uh, didn't have enough money, didn't have enough cash. It couldn't provide basic rail services. It couldn't provide buy spare parts. Um, lo locomotive and rolling stock available for service declined uh, over the over the years and the conditions of many rail railway lines deteriorated trains were slowed services were reduced and uh, the priority was placed on continuing long distance passenger services and all the assets were sucked from the freight side into the passenger world weren't sucked into it they were just dedicated to the passenger side um, to conserve, use what limited locomotives uh, it had available, they all went to the pasture side. Uh, and of course, as in most, almost every country, passenger services are a money losing operation. So this became a, a spiral of loss making for Pakistan Railways. The more it dedicated uh, its resources to the pasture business, the worse its financial position became, um, and uh, it got a, a pretty poor, pretty poor reputation. And you can see in this slide that uh, freight kilometers drifted down from the 80s, the 90s, and really dropped off in the uh, uh, in the last few years. Um, 
Container traffic and other freight movements declined precipitously. And you can see this is by commodity here. It dropped off uh, almost down to less than a million tons <coughs> uh, in the 2010, 2011, 2012 range. When, uh, uh, it when it did put resources into the freight business, it was for the emergency used to move oil or to move coal or to move something uh, uh, that was uh, uh, needed uh, to make the economy work. Um, uh, it was about this time that um, uh, 2011, geez, I try to make this thing go here. Uh, the government and the railway, desperate for investment, uh, tried a new railway access policy. Uh, infra the infrastructure project development facility, I think it's a unit of the uh, Ministry of Finance. And the railways came up with a scheme and they published a preliminary information memorandum on operating freight trains under public private private ownership it was the purpose of this was to attract private investment to have private parties buy locomotives and rolling stock and to run trains the it, it was uh, called in the in this in this document an open access policy for railways it was not really an open access policy uh, the government and railway decided what freight services they would allow to be operated by private parties. So they basically concessioned their freight services um, between specific origins and specific specific destinations, and the uh, offered those those concessions in a public bid in, in a public bidding process and the bid price w was determined by the track what the w winner of the bid or what uh, the private party was willing to pay the railway to operate its trains now recognize that the private party would have to build by its own locomotives by its own wagons uh, they were prohibited under this under this proposed arrangement from renting them or using Pakistan railway equipment, they would have to build their own terminals. Um, and the railway was going to provide, provide access. And the bid price for the, uh, for the concession was, what are you going to pay per ton kilometer? Um, so in this first set of, uh, uh, track access or open access service freight service concessions they uh, they offered uh, these oil general cargo uh, Gita that's uh, freight going to uh, um, general freight going to uh, Afghanistan and up uh, up up country uh, phosphates containers coal and cement um, there was a period of consultation, a lot of meetings uh, uh, were held. Uh, the three, after all of that work, uh, it's my understanding that three, but it may have been more, uh, private concessions were awarded based upon the high bid for track access charges. Uh, Pakistan Railway basically was to provide station facilities and access to its infrastructure. Uh, dispatching um, uh, uh, and the concessionaire was to provide everything else um, locomotives wagons drivers maintenance for its rolling stock um, all of these concessions that were uh, uh, awarded resulted in operating contracts which governed the access rights um, they were general operating contracts that I think were reasonably good 
agreements. The railway didn't go out of its way in providing uh, speedy service. Um, by our calculations, most of the uh, cycle time promises by the railway it would normally were about double what it would normally be able to do. Um, but as a as a contract contract basis, it was a place to start. Um, there were a number of private investors who were prepared to buy new rail assets. Um, they pre pre prepared operating plans. Some of them invested in private terminals, uh, spent a lot of money in private terminals. And uh, they went so far as to uh, look at uh, rolling stock and they called for expressions of interest uh, from international, you know, locomotive and wagon manufacturers. Um, total investments by the private ent in entities in the rail related services, including terminals and locomotives and rolling stock, would be uh, maybe a billion dollars, maybe a little more, or maybe a little less. Um, uh, the arrangements, uh, it seemed to me, allowed the railway and the private parties to negotiate expansions. That is to say, maybe we start out with a couple of trains, uh, trains a week or a couple of trains a day, but uh, we could, under the same operating agreements, run more. And we could probably, under the same operating agreement, add another destination or another origin. Um, unfortunately, the Pakistan Railway and the Ministry of Railway could not be persuaded to activate the concession contracts they had signed. <clears throat> I'll, I'll let how we talk about what with that. I don't know why that, that happened. Now, there were many features of the track access plan that I thought were unique to Pakistan and were a really great way to start uh, private access, uh, private train operations. Um, first of all, it wasn't like Dick talked about open access in Europe where you'd have to have a, a stack of regulations this tall to cover, to cover everything that might possibly happen. It was limited to specific uh, tracks. They were selected by Pakistan Railway, uh, I mean selected traffics, selected by Pakistan Railway um, um, as a way to begin opening this, this market. I thought that was okay. Um, they were limited to specific routes. Uh, could be expanded, both the commodities and the routes could be expanded by mutual agreement. Uh, access was governed by a contract and operating agreement. There was not a burden, there was not a, a bureaucracy to tell you uh, to, to, that you had to wait for many regulations to come up. Uh, it required no regulatory authority other than Pakistan Railways and Pakistan's legal system. Uh, there was no set access fee. People would pay, be paying different rates, which in, in many people's uh, minds, that's, that's kind of a no-no. You know, you, you can't possibly do that because um, it's discriminatory. But in, in this case, the traffic is discriminatory. You make more money on some traffic than another, so the traffic that you make more money on uh, w the the private operator would be willing to pay a higher rate. Um, uh, Pakistan Railway was not required to accept any bid. That is to say, if somebody said, oh, well, I'll run your general freight service from here to there for uh, one cent per gross ton kilometer or something, uh, they didn't have to, you know, they, they Pakistan Railway has the, the data and the the uh, the information to figure out what its track operating costs are, and it could figure out what it needed to uh, to make this profitable for it, and and I think it did. Um, the access agreement did not limit Pakistan Railway from providing a competing service on the same route, 
but it did limit the railway from allowing other private operators. So you couldn't have several people provide several private guys providing services along of the same commodity on the same route. Um, but it did provide uh, Pakistan Railway with the with the opportunity to provide service when it could get locomotives and when it could. Um, it's my understanding that, that the concession agreements that were signed, uh, I don't know, three, four, five years ago, are still in effect and would only require MPRMOR action to activate them. And the 20 year term of the of of the concession agreement was a long enough term that a private investor would be able to figure uh, how to make a return on its rolling stock investment. And the 20 year term would begin when the when the trackage rights are activated. So uh, I, I thought this was a pretty good start on um, track access in Pakistan and uh, it could have evolved into a um, I don't think it would evolve into something like the EU where you have thousands of rules and things like that but um, and you have regulatory authorities and uh, uh, a very burdensome bureaucratic system uh, but it could have evolved, I think, into multiple operators who could, even if you weren't one of the traffics that were concessioned, I can't imagine that if you were a shipper, you could come to the railway and the government and say, hey, I would like to run train services between A and B. Uh, how about how about how about putting that out? And uh, anyway, uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, I, I kind of wish it had. Thanks a lot, John. That was very, very illuminating. And, uh, you know, I would love to hear, as you said, the take from Javed and also from Ishwak Saab, because I think Ishwak Saab is partly to blame for all the things that have gone wrong with Pakistan Railways. Just joking, Ishwak Saab. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but he's he's, he's, he's been around so long. You know, I you know as far as I remember, I think since the Lou Thompson episode back in uh, when was this? Two thousand well, nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. I think that you know I, he's been there. But let me actually again for the sake of the listeners, um, uh, just say a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, you know, diversity of opinion is what we preach here at Pied, and since Nadim's allowed me to stay and moderate let me just duplicate that i per se don't think and even when i was in the world bank could not agree with having pakistan railways be its own judge jury and exec executor because the problem there is that at the end of the day the owner operator and we've seen this in the aviation sector and we see one of the reasons the road sector is so successful and well partly a mess is because of the absence of proper regulator but it is definitely providing uh, is much more open much more competitive is because we don't have this conflict i mean until pia was i mean it's still run by the civil aviation authority the air traffic control is also kind of with them this bifurcation john i mean given that we are run by saudi old british bureaucrats is is definitely um, you know required if i was in 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 the states and i had the mentality and the civil service or the absence of it in the US system, I would definitely advocate it. But you know, given that we know that the railway has been a way of life, it's overbearing, it's inefficient, they can't think properly because you know the, they have a bureaucratic mindset and that's come from an extractive bureaucracy. So first, let's keep that open for debate uh, towards the end. Um, and I think the other important thing is that the private sector who came in uh, were not really fools, right? I mean, they first built Premnagar, if I remember correctly, QICT back in 2005, six and seven. I mean, I was involved a lot more in Afghanistan, but I do remember these because I used to come here for the National Trade Corridor Improvement Program. Last but not least, you know, the, I think we need to fundamentally ask the question, why did the railway not allow this? I mean, and I think that in itself is an answer to my first question is because, you know, at the end of the day, I think that there is a lot of, um, 
The railway today, and, and this is a question for, uh, you know, basically both Ishfaq and Javed, uh, I think is more interested in its real estate than it is in operating railways. So Javed, in terms of operation, I think it's best if I put the private sector forward. Ishfaq, sir, will you mind if we get Javed's view quickly before we give kind of a closing round to you? Would that be okay if I change the, the, the sequence? It's okay with me. Okay, well, I think it's Fox silence and silence is consent. And since Javed's already put his slides up, Javed's up. So yes. that we have time for questions. We let John speak longer. I know it was unfair, but it was his first appearance here. Sorry. So, so, you know, that keep to the 10 minutes, Javed. Let's, let's go, let's go get going. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Durrani. Uh, uh, let me start with the, with the uh, actual uh, concept of practices in Pakistan. I know uh, John has covered a lot with regards to Pakistani drug access policy and his uh, uh, tenders and other processes. So I will basically try to skip those areas which are already covered by John in his presentation. I'm having some problem with my presentation sharing. I don't know. Can you guys see my screen basically? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we Thank can. You. We can. Please go. So I will skip the uh, basic introduction part of the drug access regimes in the international market. Uh, because it has already been covered by most of the participants. I'll come straight to the uh, drug access uh, policy, which has been there for a number of years. It actually started in 1995, and today we are standing in 2021. John has said correctly that the concession agreement, which was signed in 2013 precisely, uh, is still valid, is still uh, uh, have legal value, and they are good for another 20 years. Uh, this whole process of awarding this concession actually started in December 2010, and Mr. Fakhatak was also uh, actually the driving force behind these contracts in the actual track access uh, uh, projects in Pakistan. Uh, the Ministry of Finance had a company called Infrastructure Project Development Facility at that time. That company, IPDF, and the Ministry of Railways they jointly published the, the expression of interest in the newspapers, both locally and internationally. And after the, the, the uh, process for almost like, I would say around one and a half year, these bits were finally opened. And John has actually summed it up quite correctly that the railways asked for specific commodities and specific uh, directions basically. For example, from Karachi to, uh, Lala Musa, Karachi to Daud Khair, Karachi to Lahore, different commodities were advertised and the private sector was asked to bring in their investment in terms of locomotives and other things, which actually they have promised through their technical and financial base. Our company, which has been part and parcel of the freight system in Pakistan for almost like more than five decades now, we very aggressively participated in that bid and uh, we won the contract for three different directions. Karachi, Lahore, Karachi, we won the contract for the container freight trains. Karachi, Lala Musa, Karachi, and Karachi, Daud Khil, Karachi. We won the contract for coal and cement trains. And why so? Because we as company thought very aggressively in our mind, and this is what we put in our, in our uh, technical proposal also, that we have experience of like 50 years plus in operating the and handling the containers at the Karachi port. We are the only company in the country which has developed two ports uh, terminal, one at Karachi port with the name of PICT, which we developed almost like 12 years ago uh, as founder and developer. And about four years ago, we developed Pakistan's largest and the only uh, dirty bulk cargo terminal with the name of PIBT. So on the basis of these two freight commodities, we thought it is quite logical to bid for these two commodity trains as we have the cargo and we can actually transport it from south to north corridors of Pakistan. The, the objective of the track access project was quite simple. Ashfaq Khadasab is present here and he will back me on this, that at that particular time, Pakistan railways are in dire need of, uh, you know, having some sort of locomotives and freight wagons. They had no locomotives and no freight wagons available at that time. Freight wagons were, I would say, available Modern, not that much quantity. They were like sort of uh, eight-wheeler trains, high-capacity freight wagons were quite less in number. 
So we and other private sector companies aggressively pursued this project. And we thought if we can come in, if we can invest in terms of, you know, locomotives, freight operations, drivers, freight wagons, and all of their activities, and we can actually bring in efficiency into the system. It's all about efficiency in transport business. If a train which runs from Karachi goes to Lahore, having, let's say, 70 to 80 containers on it, if it only runs for two times from Karachi to Lahore and Lahore to Karachi, it does not make that much of money to you know, uh, repay its, its operating costs. Forget about the capital costs that it incurs, basically. We thought that through the efficiency into the transport system, we'll be able to you know, provide that kind of relief to Pakistan Railways, which basically it has been asking for a number of years. The, the basic parameter set for that particular uh, track access project was the guaranteed turnaround time by railways. And you know, it was a very classic example when the private sector was investing into the uh, uh, locomotives and freight wagons through capital costs, private sector was also responsible for other related costs in terms of operating costs also. And the railway was giving assurance, it is part and parcel of the agreements that railway has given guaranteed turnaround time of these trains, which is very essential in a country like Pakistan, where we do not know even today at what time the X train will depart from origin one and at what time it will actually reach a destination Y. We, we, we have told <coughs> Pakistan Railways many times that you need to activate these track access projects, which are already there for 20 years. They don't have to invest anything. Believe you me, it is a zero investment project for Pakistan Railways. No capital cost is required. If you compare the locomotive cost, which is nothing less than like $4 million currently, if you compare the freight wagon cost, freight cars cost in, in, in the international market, which is nothing less than $100,000 today. I mean, private sector was and is willing to invest more than a billion dollars. John has said it very correctly, more than a billion dollar is there, even today is there by the private sector to invest in the railway sector. Today, when nobody is ready to invest a single rupee in Pakistan railways, private sector is still willing to invest millions of dollars in the railways project through this track access policy. Uh, we have talked a lot about import cargo in, in, in recent times, but nobody in Pakistan has talked about domestic cargo, which is almost as big as the import cargo, which is present in the country. I mean, I will show in the next few slides the potential of the cargo which is present in today's environment in the Pakistani freight market. I mean, in this slide, you can see on the screen, on the left-hand side, if the Pakistan Railways runs its trains today, they have to bear fuel costs, locomotive maintenance costs, huge wagons maintenance costs, train stops, operating costs. And the only cost that actually they have to still incur is the infrastructure cost if they run their trains. With regards to track access policy, track access projects, private operators train, there's no capital cost required. There's no fuel cost required. There's no locomotives or wagons, maintenance cost required. Train operation cost is basically on the private sector. And all these costs are borne by the private sector. And still private sector will pay to Pakistan Railways on gross 10 kilometer basis. That means even if an empty train is run from south to north or not to South Corridor, the private operators will still pay, even though they will not make any money through the empty trains, but they will still pay some amount to Pakistan Railway in terms of track access fee. I, for the last eight or nine years, I've been talking a lot to the railway senior officials, including the secretary, the federal bureaucrats, the chairman, the chief executive of the Pakistan Railways. What I have, you know, guessed through their conversation well, if the private sector comes into picture in the freight sector of the national railways, what will happen to Pakistan railways? I mean, we have tried to tell them that there's a plenty of potential available in the freight market. Imagine a country where only 4% of freight is being transported via the railway sector. 96% of the freight is being transported through the road operators. Just imagine the size of the freight market and let's see the size and compared to what Pakistan Railways is playing with that size. On the screen, you can see rough numbers here. Pakistan has two ports, Karachi port and Port Kassian. Roughly the number of uh, 
containers handled at these uh, two ports basically are more than 2 million TUs in the import side and more than 1 million TUs on the export side. Safely speaking, more than 70 per 60% of this freight is basically being transported between south to north and north to south corridor because most of the population, as John rightly said, lives on the northern parts of Pakistan, which is Punjab and other areas. A train which runs from Karachi to Lahore, if a daily train is run from Karachi to Lahore and Lahore to Karachi, in the whole year, a train will carry more than 74,000 TUs or in basic terminology, 74,000 containers. If you look at the size of the containers which are being transported from south to north are almost like 1.8 million TUs. We can see the size of Pakistan Railways market share in terms of containers freight train. Only 74,000 containers are being transported, less than 100,000, while the size of the market is like 1.8 million TUs. It's, it's, if the track access trains are run uh, as per the current track access project, two container trains are allowed to the private operators that they can run from south to north and north to south corridor. If that is kept in mind, Pakistan Railways will be able to provide only 6% of market share to the private sector. There's a currently almost 32 trains daily potential available on the tracks of Pakistan Railways for the container trains only. Let's see the coal market size. If the coal market is, is, is taken into account, currently Pakistan is handling almost like 15 million tons of coal. 6 million tons of coal is being transported to the Saiwal power plant, which Pakistan railway transports itself. And the almost nine to 10 million tons in being imported by the cement plants for their consumption, which is mostly in the Northern parts of Pakistan. Again, a uh, coal train, if it is run on a daily basis on these corridors, it can hardly transport 750,000 tons of coal through daily service on this corridor. Size of the market is 15 million tons per annum. With that size in mind, only coal side, we can have 20 coal trains on a daily basis from south to north corridor. Oil market is totally virgin in Pakistan. Hardly any oil train is running in the, in the Pakistani uh, railway side. More than 400 oil uh, tank wagons are sitting idle, doing nothing. One oil train can carry almost like 1,800 tons from south to north of Pakistan. This is with the concept that the federal government la, almost like one and a half year ago gave permission to Pakistan railways and Pakistan state oil and ask them to run oil train from south to north corridor, but nothing is being done. Only that side of the freight trains carry a potential of like 14 trains on a daily basis. If you combine all these trains together, 32 container trains, 24 coal trains, 20 oil trains, almost like 76 is the number of freight train size, which can be run and should be run on the corridors of Pakistan railways. Currently, hardly nine to trains are being run. In the track access project, the private operators were given right to run hardly four trains. You can see there is still plenty of room available even if the private sector plays its role and runs its freight trains on the corridors from south to north of Pakistan. Uh, for the information of the audience and everybody, I met the Federal Minister of Railway this morning. Uh, I'm in Islamabad today. I pursued this project again, and I asked him, sir, these are the projects which are signed and ready to be executed today. If you, give in, if you give a green signal today, it will take another one and a half to two years for the private sector to bring in its own locomotives, to bring in its own freight wagons and start operations. So it's still one and a half to two years is required. Even you is today, you start thinking in your mind that you are ready to execute this project. You know, frankly speaking, everybody is very nice. People say in railways, yes, we are willing to, you know, uh, execute this project. These are nice project. We have no operating cost into this. We have zero capital cost into this. Why they don't do it? It's a million dollar question. I really do not have any answer to this. 
Thank you very much, uh, Javed. I think that was very, very, I think, <laughs> uh, well, it's not really a million dollar question, is it? I mean, it may be a million dollar question, but it has a one rupee answer, um, which is political <laughs> sloganeering and inability of politicians to make up their minds whether they want to just keep a job provision market open through the PR. And the PR itself, I think, is an incestuous institution. I think the two, three things which I wanted the audience to take before I give it over to Ishfaq Saab to kind of give his closing remarks on today. Uh, I think the political slograining loss of jobs is a myth. And Javed, you know it, John knows it, Dick knows it. Uh, Dick, if you remember, we used to have this great presentation, you know, in 2000, 2004, where you, me, and Paul Amos used to show them the slides. I guess it was Argentina, or which I, one of the Latin American railways, where we showed them the, how the <laughs> job sector actually increased x folds since the sector was privatized and you allowed private operation. So, for example, if there are, let's say, 100,000 people employed in the railway sector directly today, uh, the good guess is in, a, in five years from opening it up and allowing all this access to happen, you could have 500,000 people working there. So it's really nobody loses a job except the slots and the people who are not willing to work. Uh, so at the end of the day, not, it's the point second I want all the audience to understand this is exactly what's happened in the aviation sector. If you look at the sector from 98 to 2005, six times the number of people were employed directly or indirectly in the aviation sector within seven years of allowing uh, access and other airlines to come in and start operation. So, you know, and the last point is about the local freight. I think that's an amazing point made by Javed. People forget that the size of the internal movement market is, as, a, as per our last calc, our, no, not our, World Bank's last calculation. Seven years, I still make that mistake. According to the bank's last calculation, it's six times the size of the international market. And I think Javed's figures ought to, ought, ought already tell you that. But Shvak Saab, I didn't want to make you mad. Can you come back on screen? We love you. Can we have you provide some closing remarks? <laughs> I think Ishwak is, uh, oh, he's coming back on. Me? Sir, please turn on your camera. Can you hear me? We can definitely hear you. I was afraid you'd also taken your cocoa like Dick and gone back to sleep. But, but it, <laughs> I think it's a tad too early for you, sir. You can't see me? Uh, we can't see you, but you have the mic now. One minute. Now we can see you. Yeah, we now can we... see you now. Can you see the presentation? Uh, no, not a good presentation yet, yeah. One minute, let me. So Javed, while Ishfaq's putting on his presentation, I, when I left the World Bank in 2014, I came back, I put a proposal that if they let me run a complete train, I mean, my estimation was $130 million, secondhand equipment, I can have the first train running in about a year and a half. Um, luckily or unluckily, I, I sold my shares in that company I created in 2019. Uh, so now I yap about these things, but I've really decided to exclude myself from my dreams of ever running a railway in Pakistan. So, you know, within five years, the railway convinced me, uh, you have a much better backer, Mr. Siddiqui, who I know very well, the entire family, the lots of money. I wish them well. Can you I see hope it now? You guys can open the sector. No, sir, we cannot. I don't know. There's some problem. It says that try later. Uh, Nabira Mansur, but can then you? Maybe I can. Yeah. Why don't you just Why don't you just help us and I mean uh, think through this. I, I think the summary question to you, Ishak Saab, why is the government not doing it? I mean, I think we've learned about access. We've learned about whatever. I think the two areas where you can actually do a verbal uh, brief to our audience. And first and foremost, what were you thinking when you made this? what John calls an interesting uh, and unique track access approach. And uh, second, uh, why, why is it not happening as yet? Well, Amir, I, think well, two... Amir, I, have, I have my presentation as, as those as told that I have to look at the track access regime in the Pakistan context. So when you talk of Pakistan context, you have to be aware what Pakistan Railways is first. So it is for the viewers and, and the listeners to understand what we are talking about. So just Pakistan Railways at a glance, I'll just tell you that Pakistan Railways, when, when, and these are 
uh, issues which I'm going to raise and most of the questions that we, we, you ask, why, why is it not happening? They are maybe in, in this presentation. It actually, Pakistan Railways, when you talk, it is a federal government department under the Ministry of Railways and it comprises of operations and man, uh, manufacturing and services and it operates under the old 1890 Indian Railway Act. Of course, it, this doesn't stop us from going into the track access regime. That is one good thing. And it works under the rules of business. As John said, this is a beautiful trade corridor. We call it the National Trade Corridor, Karachi, Gawadar, Karachi, and the hinterland in Punjab. Then you have this transit potential to China, Iran. And, uh, but when we talk of freight here, and I'll be talking of freight only, not passenger, on the track access regime. You have to be very clear, it is about bulk, it is about long haul, and it is about railable freight. The encouraging uh, independent traffic forecasts for now and for the future say that by 2025, we'll have about 34 to 40 million tons to be carried uh, from uh, and to Karachi and to the north. Now, these are good figures. We are just doing seven or eight million now. And in 2012, we were just doing about a million tons. So this is the map of Pakistan Railways, the ML1, so-called Main Line 1, and the Main Line 2, and Main Line 3, and the other uh, sort of uh, branch lines and subsidiary lines. But Main Line 1 carries 80%, and that is where the basic open access is coming in. Now, route kilometers, when we say it is a medium-sized railways, both on the passenger side and the freight side, when compared to the world, um, uh, we have about 7,700 uh, kilometers it looks good, but most of it is obsolete signaling system and about 70% overage. Then we have the axle load is about 22.86. Now these are factors which need to be kept in mind because the private sector uh, should know what, what they're investing in. Then now we have about 461 locomotives and 323 are functional, the rest are not functional. And even the functional need a lot of repairs. So the freight wagons, the railway has only 3,715 are good railway wagons. The rest, I can tell you, they're all obsolete. And we are running 72 trains. We used to run 274 in 2010. And we have about 9 to 11 trains coming out, which is very good for today. We are, in 2012, we had one train coming out of Karachi, freight train. So then this just an analysis of what has gone wrong actually in the railways. You see, it has been a focus on the passenger side in 74 and 75 when the railway was do railways was doing good, uh, financially doing good, technically it was okay, services were good. Look at the passenger uh, revenues, that they were just 30%, now 69%. The freight revenues were 64%, now we have come down to 15%. So that is where the bread and butter is and that is where the railways is not concentrating. And look at the locomotives, that is the locomotive power. That is actually the bread and butter of railways. So uh, 165 and 74, 1974, and we have come down to 50 only. So well, these are we are sorry to interrupt, but you are talking about Pakistan railways. Today we want to talk about no, the sector. But I'm talking about Pakistan <laughs> railways in the track access regime context. Let me just finish this. Now this is, we, uh, today it is a 50 billion deficit. So the track access regime, as Siddiqui Saab pointed out, we started in 93, 94, 95, because seven IPPs uh, uh, were to be established and furnace oil was to be carried. That is when the concept of RICOs came in and the open access policy. And now 1996, and this is 2021, and we are still not there. So that is what I want to just point out. Now, at that time, the private uh, power infrastructure board was ma made the lead agency, not the railways. Private railway uh, companies were to bring in their own locomotives and tank wagons and operate PR on PR's infrastructure by paying a track access charge on per ton kilometer basis. I know it is very simple. Uh, when you look at Australia, when you look at Europe, here it is just one railway. So that way it is simple. But when you look at the, the, the dynamics of the government, when you look at the dynamics of Pakistan Railways, then it becomes very complicated. That is why we are not going anywhere. So that recourse, of course, for carrying oil, they had to uh, sign agreements with the PSO and the railways. Uh, the principle of that track access charge, which still remains, is that you look at the market transportation rate, you minus the RICO cost. RICO means the private sector company. 
and minus the tax and you get a tax success charge band within that then you can operate and track excess charge has to be more than the long run incremental cost of the railway trains are going to go then what happened is this policy was there everything happened but no implementation by pr or the government of pakistan then what happened is that we went into another spin the railways went down we went into restructuring and in 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 uh, this uh, 97 98 99 2000 things were really bad so when things go bad of course we remember the private sector but then everyone says okay let us do something about the railways and restore it and exactly that is what happened uh, when we in 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 uh, 2000 to 2007 when in 2010 and 2011 again the railway said okay bring the private sector in why because things were really bad and we went on these road shows in lahore and karachi and there was a big response so in 2012 the ipdf which is the infrastructure uh, project development facility under the ministry of finance uh, took up this task why not the railways because there was not a lot of faith in railways by the private sector so in july 2012 these uh, rfps were given out a transparent bidding process was done in september 2012 i think this was a good uh, exercise within 5 6 months uh, successful bidders uh, came up and we started the railway started negotiating private train operators to, were to operate trains on predetermined paths and conditions now here the path was also determined they had to pay for the path if you want a good path a clear path you had to pay for it and they pay had to pay for a commodity and they had to pay between two destinations now as as the john i think rightly pointed out it is the commodity which um, can bear the cost there are certain commodities like oil which can pay you much more so the track excess charge needs to be more i know john will not agree but this was a good start so capex about 9 billion rupees for today in today's terms which is about 58 million dollars this capex is for the locomotives and the rolling stock provided you want to run one train for 1000 kilometers maybe uh, from karachi to saiwal say and uh, this is about 9 billion rupees now of course then you have to pay the fuel costs and the maintenance costs and these and in this concept an escrow account was also kept for track track maintenance and of course you need a, pr- pr- a regulator an independent regulator when you have the private sector coming in but here since we didn't have a regulator the federal government inspector of railways these private parties accepted him as a regulator for the time being later on the regulator could come in in the goods and products were defined like oil for lalpeer as was pointed out and lahore port for the outfail uh, goods and transit to afghanistan for peshawar containers for lahore so all most of the commodities were here and a track excess charge on the basis of gross ton uh, kilometer was to be charged and when we looked at the economics when we looked at the financials when the studies were done the oil trains and most of these container trains they were paying themselves out within a period of 5 to 6 years which is a really really good uh, payback period for a project which is 20 years and the irr was at 20% so three successful bidders uh, private train operators were selected through a transparent bidding process in may 2013 and till the, this day sadiqi sahab is one of them they are still looking Uh, here and there as to what to what should be done the railways of course again is not allowing them we had changes in the government in 2014 again in 18 but the 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 uh, agreements are still in the cold storage where they remain this day and some of them i believe i have been told that these private op- operators have now gone to the uh, courts which is a bad thing now the way forward very simple john said it Siddiqui Sahib said it very simple. PR should take a bold decision and implement these agreements immediately, enabling the private concessionaires to start. And these are concessionaires. Uh, maybe John is right. This is not the proper open access to start placing orders for rolling stock, which will take at least eighteen months to two years. So if we start today, we tell them, okay, you go ahead. It will take them another two years to 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 come up with their locomotives and their freight wagons and carry uh, freight. on pakistan railway track by paying a track so this is now a dilemma and uh, maybe in the question answers 
session i can i can reply to what is what is the problem it is i think the overall environment of the government of the uh, the investment uh, uh, sort of uh, environment which is uh, you see in pakistan you look at the the the, the cases against business people the so business people are very very sensitive people they don't want to get into messes no. so thank you thank you for thank you. let me hand it over to nadeem saab oh, sir welcome back thank you amir uh, thank you very much this is wonderful i've learned a lot i must confess i never knew all this but let me just raise a few questions with you amir as well as the speakers um the one thing i still remember shafak saab i was in the planning commission when you came with the track access uh meetings and tracks access reports etc and we attended some of those meetings and i was always puzzled what am i doing at these meetings and i was always puzzled my friend fees sheikh was the finance minister was chairing the meetings and i always used to ask him after the meeting why are we doing this i mean i never could understand why we were taking up pakistan railways tracks access charges in the cabinet in senior government department meetings when we knew nothing about railways i'm an economist i don't know railways i don't need to know railways but yet and there i think is a fundamental issue but that you must face what is railways in pakistan and i li like john and uh, uh, dick to also comment in pakistan railways what shafak said uh, shafak sab said is of the operative statement it is a department of the government i was just trying to find a balance sheet of the railways i couldn't find it i was trying to find a proper income statement you know accounting statements of the railways and they were hard to find and they're sort of obsolete old things it's a government department which has no sense of responsibility for the railways who's responsible for the railways who's responsible for losses it's all over the place the government takes it up whenever they like the management of the railways doesn't have to worry about the losses because hey it's a government department they're very comfortable in their meow gardens in the nice residences they don't have to take any serious decisions they know their losses are covered so the question to dick dick and john first is do you know of a country where a railway is a government department with sovereign guarantees of all kinds with no responsibilities no accounting and if there is such a department can they sign these de deals credibly for example railway is a very important deal that we signed with the gulf coast in the last 20 years ago and it has been reversed because railway has pushed hard to reverse it so where is credible contracting what are we talking about is this is this just bureaucratic mumbo jumbo that we had a track access system that we never wanted to go ahead with we didn't know what it was because ministers were sitting there chairing <coughs> meetings and trying to decide what track access charges was were so my question to you is isn't it important for us to organize railways as a commercial entity first and not a government department for all this to happen anybody wants to take that up yes i, I, yeah, I think I, that uh, maybe we'll um, hear from dick and john because if i remember correctly shafak sab in the first sem webinar which we had last year i think dick provided some very interesting statistics on pakistan being unique in terms of a railway department uh, dick do you want to take that and then john uh, and then maybe then shafak shafak sab hum aaj se aap se baad mein sunenge kyunki aap hukumti nukta nazar na dijiyega anyway so i'll come back to shafak sab and nadeem sab you can yeah go ahead i i think that an entire mess is because of the government so i i i'm not a government man anyway i think you've got it wrong amir mm -hmm. what i'm trying to say is that since it is a federal government department the government needs to take that responsibility of what has gone wrong that is why we should so my point is it should not be Ashok sir, my point is, it should not be a government department. It should be a commercial entity because only a commercial entity can sign deals. A government department signs deals. That's like a child abuser signing a deal with the with the child. You hit the nail on the head. But then, government needs to decide through one policy directive, saying, "Okay, we let go of you." This is what happened all over the world. This is what has almost happened in China and other countries. So this is what I want to ask. Ishwak Dala, so maybe maybe we have guests from abroad, so maybe we can ask. Uh, there, there is Saeed Akhtar who wants to speak, Javed wants to, but maybe John, you want to comment on uh, Nadeem's question? This is a Chicago School economist, so be wary of how you answer this. So. <laughs> 
Well, uh, I, my, my view on what should happen to Pakistan Railways is that you should convert it to an enterprise. And um, in the strategy document that we did with the ADB and the Pakistan Railways, that was the ultimate strategy. The railway was to become a private enterprise or, or a, a state-owned enterprise, and it would have several entities within it, including a freight business and a pasture business. So the pasture business would be subsidized. Um, and how the infrastructure was organized was le left to be evolve. But uh, I agree with you that it is it is a, it's now operated as a government department. It's not incumbent upon anybody to make a profit. Nobody knows what their financial statements look like. Um, they don't even know what a financial statement is. Uh, it it runs on government accounting, cash accounting, not not on uh, normal. So I I think that would be really good, but uh, that may take some time to do. It's politically very difficult and. The railway could do track access tomorrow. It doesn't have to wait for that. Uh, I, I think it, as long as pa if Pakistan continues to wait to open up its rail sector to the private sector, it's it's losing uh, it's losing opportunity. Um, not not only uh, the investment that comes from the private sector, people willing to buy locomotives and able uh, and to buy wagons and to build new terminals uh, if they can have access to the infrastructure. But it's also, and I think even more important than the investment, is the innovative thinking that comes from the private sector. Um, uh, you have if you opened the, if you had an access arrangement, you would probably, not at first, because nobody trusts the railway. Um, no, no commercial business trusts the railway. But once you had some trust built up, you would have people knocking on the doors to run trains for this and trains for that and say, hey, we'd like to run this, we'd like to run that. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I agree with you, John. There's no question about it that nobody's saying wait on anything. But the question is that with an entity that is government owned, that is has no financial statements, that doesn't even know what its assets are. I mean, railway doesn't even know what its assets are. How can it credibly engage anybody? But let me, let's take that up later. Let's ask Sayyid Akhtar Sab. Go ahead, Sayyid Akhtar Sab. So please introduce yourself and ask your question. Okay. Oh, hang on. I'll. Uh... Put my video on. I am Sayyid Akhtar. Uh, I have been also the Manager of Pakistan, the Chief Executive Officer of Pakistan Railways, and yeah. uh, colleague with Mr. Shah Khatak and all that. I have been attached, I have been, uh, been kept attached with this uh, track access since 1995, when I was mm -hmm. not a senior officer. So <clears throat> I failed to understand, honestly speaking, that in last almost 25 years, we have not been able to make it a success. We understand the concept. Everybody is convinced that it is a, something very useful for Pakistan Railways. But why we could not uh, do that? We must analyze these reasons. And unless, unless we do not identify what are the factors which are obstructing it, I think success would be a bit difficult. Coming uh, one by one to Nadimur Haksab's uh, observation that it is a government department and it cannot perform like this. I, I, there is no true opinion about it. It has to be commercial. It has to be anonymous, autonomous. But fact remains that even the government department, is it justified to perform so poorly about it, so poorly as it is performing? If we see the example of Indian Railways, that is still a government department but definitely performing better than us in, in all aspects. And we, and, and we, uh, when uh, we were uh, uh, autonomous railroad in uh, late 60s and in even early 70s, 
we were performing better but by unfortunately if you see the history the powers of the railway board has been snatched by and by by and by by and by and from an autonomous body it has been converted into a dependent body dependent on everybody dependent on establishment we and dependent on finance dependent on uh, you can say dependent on everybody so i think that has to be done that yes it has to be commercial organization autonomous but before that until it is a government department it should perform better one second thing is that uh, this issue of uh, who is handling this uh, track access in pakistan railways that is one thing i want to touch it when we talk pakistan railway pakistan railway is constituted about the four different departments infrastructure traffic commercial and mechanical now when we if we are asking the traffic and commercial department ashwal sahab would uh, bear it with me we are asking a department to create a generate their own competitor which they will never like to do i think uh, john winner will uh, tell me out that is the world wide it is the infrastructure department who have to handle the track access uh, issue who have to rent out or uh, lease out their uh, infrastructure to the private parties and run the trains until unless it is in the hand of those people who will not like to create their competitors how can it be successful that is one thing very important and if you see i think javed ji ji sahab has uh, 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 not uh, told some things which he has been facing that how the people were raising objections is very crumsy of the of the situation on the success what will happen with us if we if all come the people will come take the all the traffic and we will be nowhere like this this all thing so i think the number one point is that it is not being handled at a proper place second thing is that it uh, last time uh, ashwas sawar to mention about the line capacity this is one of the reasons which is quoted that we have a limited line capacity and we cannot run additional trains again it is not correct if we see that there are two sources one is that we are using still the orthodox uh, formula uh, of calculating the line capacity and squat formula and still if we calculate as the squat formula the line capacity is more than 50 and if we see the study of jica which was done in 1994 and later in 2006 also they calculated the line capacity as per jnr formula as per pakistan railway formula and they indicated the line capacity of 50 plus but still the pakistan railway continues insisting that line capacity is not more than 30 which is not correct <coughs> and until unless we have blocked our minds that we have we cannot run more than 30 trains we will not allow to run any additional train the third thing is that uh, 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 it has been mentioned by ishwa khatak sahab condition of the infrastructure it is bad it is getting bad that's very correct but it should be a concern of the train operator who is coming to run their train it is their risk basically and in spite of all that bad things if they want to come they want to run their train should the infrastructure condition be a obstruction for them i am very sure that if they come they run the train the infrastructure will automatically start improving by default and uh, one thing i also feel is that still there is a lack of political commitment also in this respect if a political government really decides to implement it to go ahead with it and find the reasons and uh, uh, remove the obstruction i think oh. this is not something which cannot be done ever thank you very much but sai sab i think both you and ashfaq sab have to answer a question i think there's a lot of passing the buck here and this is exactly what happened when you got a government department you tell me indian railways are running better than pakistan railways agreed and you tell me someone should care but then tell me you have been senior management in railways why has that not been your concern or ashok sahab concern or anybody's concern that railways infrastructure is going down tracks are going everything is depreciated everything is eroded and yes the ministry plays god politics plays on but where is the management of the railways and what is railways i don't even know what railways is railways is just like any other division of the government and it operates with the finance minister the chairman i was there i was there sitting as the chairman of the railways trying to decide on tax access charges which i found very funny i found it like monty python please explain that to me 
ट्रेन The problem is okay. what is stopping them now. Nadeem Sahib, uh, the issue is that we have this political control of the railways now. There is no railway board as such, which used to take all these policy okay. decisions. So when you have a political government, then you go to the political people. You were there as a minister. I remember as a vice chairman of planning, and you you rightly pointed out we used to go to the from pillar to post, from the finance to the planning, not knowing what the railways is. that is why because the decisions were not taken policy decisions were not taken and this is a policy decision which needs to be taken immediately so that the private sector comes in irrespective of whether the line capacity is 32 or 22 or 50 or 24 i don't know but the okay. capacity is still there. just need no, these three decisions to start running nadeem sir then can Sorry. i ask i think that can, can i Dr Sahab sorry I I have to beg leave but I must say one thing you know I always say this that you know to live again one must first die so the issue is there has to be a political solution to Pakistan railways Pakistan railway itself will never put itself out of a job that's the reality just as simply as I can put it but thank you for joining back and can I beg leave and I'll uh, take Jawa Javed okay fair enough let me just thank you. let me just ask John and uh, Dick a question Uh, John Dick, you've been international consultants. Both of you said you've done a lot of work for Pakistan Railways through international agencies. Now, let me ask you a simple question: Why has that not been on the top of your agenda? And the advice of the ADB and the World Bank and everybody—they've talked about investments. They've talked about putting in a lot of money into uh, all kinds of things, but nobody's talked about restructuring the railway as a commercial entity, which I find surprising. My second question to you, John and Dick, is. do the european railways or do the australian railways run on advice of the adb and the world bank etc john dick anybody <laughs> all right so uh, can you hear me oh hang on yes please i can hear you go ahead you, you can, can hear, hear you yeah uh -huh. um well i think it's a bit unfair to say that the world bank has uh, has uh, ignored the problem of the structure of the railways uh personally i've always felt that it's problem number 1 in pakistan that there is a ministry of railways uh, i don't know what the ministry does in all the time i've worked with pakistan railways <laughs> it's never been clear to me what the ministry does except slow things down and block them whenever i mean that's that's been a bit unfair a bit harsh but really i've never felt that you would go to the ministry and come away thinking oh this is great you know we can do this we can do that so i i think that uh, i don't, i can't speak for the management of the uh, world bank and the adb but i do know that um personally when i've been on working there's been there's been quite a lot of emphasis on trying to find ways in which pakistan railways can be nudged somehow towards a more commercial structure and outlook mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. as to as to whether world bank advi the advice of the ifi is, is taken in places like australia and <coughs> europe no uh, the the australia is um <laughs> uh it it sorts its own problems out not very well much of the time yeah. but it does sort its own problems mm -hmm. yeah exactly uh, john i want to come to you please tell me 
there were so many World Bank reports cited. We cite the World Bank, JICA and everything. Yet the Pakistan Railway seems to be incapable of doing any of its own research. So unlike Australia, Pakistan Railways, and I don't pick on railways, all of us, the whole country, we can't solve our own problems. We have to rely on the World Bank, JICA, ADB, etc. And yet, when it comes to the problems, they're all ours. Solutions are somebody else's. Is that a good way to operate for us? Well, of course not. And I can't, I can't speak for all the IFIs, but I know uh, I've read some of the strategy papers that date from 1996 or something like that. I know the strategy that we did for the uh, with the Asia, A, Asian Development Bank and the National Transport Strategy that the Asian Development Bank helped prepare all call for the Pakistan Railways to become a state-owned enterprise, to have a proper board of directors, to separate the uh, um, the ministry functions, the, the kind of ministerial functions from the railway commercial and operating functions. Um, I agree with you completely, that, and I agree with Dick. I don't know what the ministry does. It's like a black hole. You have a decision to make, it goes up to the ministry and it it just disappears. <laughs> I don't know what happens to it. Um, uh, I, I would, I think all of us in the strategy work that we've done for the World Bank, and I know Dick, Dick's work for the for the World Bank on Pakistan Railway strategy and mine for the a, a, for the ADB have all recommended a state-owned enterprise, a proper board, a commercial a commercial focus. Uh, we went, we built a, a whole uh, commercial financial model for the railway, which separated out its pensions and put them over on a over over on the ministry side, not on the railway side, um, as you would do with any any commercial entity. Um, I I don't know why. Yes, I do. I, I mean, I say I don't know why n none of those things have happened. Of course, I know why n none of those things have happened. It's political. The railway employs eighty thousand people. It's a big. It's the biggest, probably single industry in Pakistan. Everybody wants to have their hands in it, and everybody does. Javed Sab, Javed Sadiqi Sab, you want to say something? Yes, uh, a couple of things very quickly before. Uh... Uh, we close this. Uh, you know, on a policy level, government should take a decision whether railways, Pakistan railways, should work as infrastructure manager or not. In my opinion, in most of the countries in the world, most of the national railways work as infrastructure manager only. And that's the things are done by mostly the private operators. For example, if you're talking about freight here, railways, they have given this freight business to one of their departments, which is called traffic and commercial. Traffic is like operations, commercial is like sales. They have combined these two departments together and they have been there for ages, I mean, since 1947 or maybe before now. It's time for the government to take a policy decision whether the government needs to operate Pakistan Railways as a commercial department, as a department, or as just infrastructure manager. And that infrastructure manager as National Railways should give these track access kind of projects to the private sector and earn money through the access fee, basically. We have been talking about freight, freight, freight. In the last 70 years, if Ashfaq Saab would basically back to this, Pakistan Railways has not developed a single freight terminal. Any freight commodity you name today, either is container, coal, or any other commodity, they don't have any at origin or destination proper handling facility, let's, let's suppose we call it freight terminal. They have not worked on this. We have been pursuing this with railways that at least you have plenty of land available at origin and destination. You just let the private sector to develop these built, operate and transfer basis uh, uh, terminals for you. They will invest, private sector will invest. You will have state of the art terminals built through these private operators. And you can now have excellent facilities for 10 years, 20 years basis. Uh, railways, Pakistan Railways had formed a company a few years ago, which is called Pakistan Railways Freight Transportation Company. The concept was 
that the railways will not operate the freight business itself. The company will basically operate the freight business. Again, like five, six years down the road, we don't see any resource planning there. We don't see any resource building there. That company is there, it's just on the piece of paper. Nothing has been done by the Pakistan Railways or the Ministry of Railways as we, we rightly pointed out, basically. Last but not the axle load regime. We have heard a lot about axle load regime in the country. Few months ago, like about 12, 13 months ago, the government decided to implement axle load. You know, the who is the biggest beneficiary of the exit road regime implementation in the country? Pakistan Railways. Look at the numbers and statistics of those months when the exit road was actually implemented in the country. Railways revenue had actually jumped up because they are the biggest beneficiary. They need to work on a system with the government that because of the exit road regime, they, because of the non-implementation of the regime, there are plenty of problems being faced by the country road depreciation basically wear and tear cost national highway department invests more than 50 billion rupees every single year on the infrastructure maintenance if the excel load regime is done pakistan railways will have more demand in the country to operate their freight trains on a viable mode but again nobody thinks or basically works on these kind of concepts in the country i don't know why Brother, sir, why should we think about it you got nice cushy jobs, new garden houses, GR houses. Why should we think about that? It's a great colonial regime that's in place. Peer Saad Asmuddin, you have been trying to pursue this business. Tell me, you're from Harvard. What's your view on this? Hi, Nadeem. Sorry, I'm on the motorway, so kind of doesn't matter. I'm sure you can out. do uh, you can do two tasks at the same time. Go ahead. Okay, um, I think uh, the parties, uh, the speakers have actually covered this really, really well. They've covered all the points. Uh, you know, working in emerging markets and investing in frontier markets, which I've been doing for over 20 years, I must say we always have to take a long view of stuff. But one thing I do say about the Pakistani um, bureaucracy is that I am not as afraid of, of their uh, bad intentions as I am of their incompetence. And barring, <laughs> a, barring the senior people, and I honestly tell you, if you compare the secretary level or the CEO levels, and you know, at this level, the bureaucrats are smarter than I am. They're better trained, they're better management professionals. But at the lower level, the level of uh, actual incompetence and under lack of understanding. Standing is shocking. Uh, out of it. But coming to the point, uh, there is a desire to actually get things going. And uh, they realize that it's been seven years uh, in the waiting. Both Javed that we have had a lot of uh, capital outstanding uh, behind these projects. And uh, we're hoping that to bring good news and close this out within the next few months. Uh, but I've been saying that for a while. So my optimism <laughs> is the gray hair on my head now, finally. I actually had a whole set of black hair when I started this project. It's now white. So um, having said that, I think uh, this is an amazing opportunity for Pakistan because if you look at it, let's look at three things and I'll, on a serious note. The first telecom license sold for $5 million. The second telecom license has went for $250 million. Recently, we sold one for a billion dollars. All of these processes need to take place, right? The first license, somebody may say that the track access is low when it's not. And compared to Spain and most of Europe, our track access charges are higher. But again, it has to be a process which starts from somewhere. The second thing is look at how much money Pakistan Telecom uh, has made or look at how much the banks make, how much they contribute in taxes, how much they contribute in employment and how much economic activity they generate. So this actually has to now go beyond the public sector and into the private sector, because this will open up a whole new category of uh, economic activity, because I can transport a container, uh, I mean, I, a bogey from Karachi to Lahore at about 60% of the time and at about 70% of the cost, right? So there's a huge economic environment 
um, time, logistic, cost, and benefit. There, the one thing which our government always overlooks is that there's a World Bank report which says that Pakistan lose, uh, used to lose two percent of GDP growth due to energy in the big energy crisis. The same reports say that we lose four to six percent because of transport uh, inefficiencies. So imagine the GDP growth gains you get there. Uh, um, so at the end of the day, uh, I think you're a great voice. Uh, you're a great, we look upon you to go and lobby for us as well and make sure Javed and my train start running really soon. Okay, great. Well, if anybody doesn't want, if anybody has something to say, speak now, otherwise we we'll close the session. I think it's been a wonderful session. I think it's been great. We've learned a lot. I certainly have learned a lot. But I would, I would urge you, John and Dick, to advise the World Bank and other donors to please focus on reorganizing the railways. Let's not focus on doing quick fix solutions without getting our commercial entities right. This is the price we paid in energy too, where again, the World Bank is responsible. We have huge energy losses because the system was never configured. I'm afraid in the railways, it's the same system. Whether we will bring the private sector in or not, we will have huge losses in the railways. The problem, as Dan Nassimoglu and Robinson, many people have to pointed out, is getting the governance system right. Trying for quick fix solutions without getting the governance right is seeking second best solutions and unintended consequences happen like they happened for the uh, Pakistan power system. We planned, World Bank plan failed, and we paid a price of 10 trillion rupees. I urge you to think about it. Could tax access charges do the same with railway not being made into a clear commercial entity where it operates like a like an agency that's full of holes, like a surf in, a, in an ocean. And I think we'll end up in deeper trouble. But that's where I come in. I think we require private thinking. That's where PID comes in. We have outsourced too much of our thinking, of our strategy to donors. And we pay the price. They never seem to take the responsibility. I think we should do like Australia, try and solve our problems for a while and try and see if we can fix things. Thank you, folks. We will take this up again. Ahmed Durrani is going to lead a whole set of enterprise railway research webinars. We leave it to Ahmed to take us to the next step. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye.